So, Brother Carr, thank you for coming to share the word of the Lord tonight. For those who may not know, that's my authority. But these old eyes won't pick it up from the pulpit anymore. So I have it typed up in 16 point type where I can read it. If I can get it right side up. Isaiah saw it in the ninth chapter, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, forever. <clears throat> Six words, unto us a child, a son. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. There are so many beautiful events that circle around the Christmas story that it's impossible to cover all of them. Prophetically, Isaiah saw so many things about the life of Jesus, his life even as a baby, baby and his ministry and finally his death and resurrection, so much of it. And Isaiah seemed to have had the clearest view of Jesus of any of the Old Testament prophets. <clears throat> But we just want to consider this part of Isaiah's prophecy concerning Jesus. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Unto us a child, a son. A child is born, Mary's child. The term young child is used nine times in Matthew chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. He was Mary's Firstborn, Luke 2, 7, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. To say firstborn would imply that there were others to come. And in Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 to 56, we read, When he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, where has this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? So Jesus was the big brother in a family with four other boys and at least two sisters. <clears throat> There's a possibility that the little book of Jude was written by Jesus' brother Judas, but he just starts off saying he's a servant of Jesus and a brother of James. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 and 47, while he talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one of them said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers stand without desiring to speak with you. So Jesus had brothers and sisters. He grew up as a normal child. Luke chapter 2, verse 40, the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. In verse 52, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. <clears throat> Jesus was an unusual child in many ways. For one thing, the angels sang about him when he was born. In Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, 
glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And the prophet Simeon prophesied concerning him when he was brought to be presented to the Lord. In Luke chapter 2, verses 30, 25 to 34, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. And then the wise men came to worship him as our Chaplain pointed out to us on Wednesday night so much about the wise men. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's interesting that he was always the center of it. Mary wasn't, Joseph wasn't, Jesus was always the center of it. No doubt you will see a sign in somebody's yard this year that says wise men still seek him, and they do. If you're wise, you will seek the Lord. <clears throat> a child is born, but he said a son is given. He didn't say a son is born. A child is born, a son is given. It's interesting that over 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah saw that Jesus was the son that was given. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Isaiah saw that over 700 years before Jesus was born. Now, God claims Jesus as his son. In John 3, 16, we mentioned a while ago that a child was born, but a son was given. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. A son was given. And so it, we are told that in John 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
And verse 18, he that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. <clears throat> At his baptism, God claimed him as his son. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God's beloved Son, a Son, was given. <clears throat> At his transfiguration, again, God acknowledges Jesus as his Son. Jesus took Peter, James, and John up into a high mountain and was transfigured before them. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, the voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. God acknowledged Jesus as his Son. At his resurrection, he was declared to be the Son of God. In Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. His resurrection declared that he was the Son of God. When he was on the cross, they said, if you're the Son of God, come down and we will believe. But he didn't come down. He stayed on the cross. God had a greater proof than that. He could have called for legions of angels who would have delivered him, but he didn't do that. He went all the way to the cross, through the cross, to the resurrection, which declared him to be the Son of God with power. <clears throat> Believing that Jesus is the Son of God makes a difference. It made a difference in Saul of Tarsus. Immediately after his conversion, he acknowledged the deity of Christ, showing that he is God's son. Acts 9.20, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. He had only recently been saved, met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and now he is declaring that Jesus is the son of God. It made a difference in the Ethiopian. In Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaks the prophet this. Now he was reading from the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah, where he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And he said, who's, his, who's he writing about, himself or somebody else? And Philip started at that passage of scripture and preached Jesus. And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached Jesus to him. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me to be baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing because he had met Jesus. Believing that Jesus is God's Son brings us life, eternal life. In John 20, verses 30 and 31, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Believing that Jesus is God's Son makes a difference, not only for Saul of Tarsus and the Ethiopian, but it makes a difference for us as well. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. God dwells in him, and he in God. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus 
is the Son of God. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Unto us. That Mary had a child is meaningless unless it has meaning to us. That God sent his son is meaningless unless it has meaning to us. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. This is what gives meaning to the whole truth of Jesus' coming is that it is personal with us. <clears throat> Even prophetically, the message was personal unto us. The angel said to the shepherds, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Unto you, personal, something that they could identify with. The shepherds got the message in Luke chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. It came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child that he has made known to us. This is God's secret revealed to us. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things that are revealed belong to us. In John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Full of grace and truth, John bore witness of him and cried, saying, This is he of whom I spoke. He that comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 19 and verse 9 and 10. As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So many people quote that passage and stop. But the scripture doesn't stop there. It goes right on to say, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So the things that the eye has not seen or the ear heard, that man has not even imagined, the Holy Spirit takes those things and reveals them unto us. <clears throat> In Colossians 1, 13 to 15, we are told, his dear son is the image of the invisible God. John chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he will receive of mine and show it unto you. So it's coming directly to us. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He takes the things of Jesus and reveals them to us. It's not a dark mystery somewhere. It's an open revelation to us. God wants us to know him. He's never been trying to hide himself from us. He wants us to know him. So he sent Jesus to make God known to us. But just in case we missed the message, he sent the Holy Spirit to explain Jesus to us, to make Jesus real to us, to show us what the written word is saying about the living word. Jesus is manifested to us. Unto you is born this day a, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. As the power of God... Recorded in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. As wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, 
sanctification and redemption, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Paul, the apostle, got the message. Ephesians 3, 8, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Peter got the message and related to us, 1 Peter 2, 7, unto you which believe he is precious. This is what Jesus intended in Luke chapter 22, verses 29 and 30. Pardon me, 19 and 20. He took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave to them saying, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. He made it very personal and there's nothing better than the communion to bring us into that relationship with the Lord. One day as I read that, to, to realize it was for me, the Lord gave me a few words. Look now upon the cup so red, symbolic of the blood he shed, and in your hand the broken bread. Remember, it's for you, he said. In mind I see Gethsemane, where Jesus prayed neath olive tree. Betrayed by friend while on his knee, it was for you, it was for me. They led him then to judgment hall. Judgment? Yes, from God did fall on him in whom no guilt at all. It was for you, it was for all. A crown upon his head was placed as he was mocked and there disgraced. The sin of all the world he faced for you for all the human race. The nails were driven into his hand. I now behold God's perfect plan, his son, the gulf to God did span for you, for me, for all of man. To set the guilty sinner free from sin, from guilt, from misery, he died in shame upon the tree for all the race, for you, for me. The message got through. First John chapter one, verses one to four. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, to us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. He said what we have heard what we have seen, what our hands have handled. The message is meaningless unless it gets through to us. God communicated his love to us through Jesus. He communicates the message of his love to us through the Bible. He confirmed it to us by the Holy Spirit. Now he wants us to communicate his love to one another. And when we do, the world will come to know him. John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. So our love one to another is a manifestation to the world that Jesus is God's son. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Father, we thank you that you sent that son. Our eyes were so blinded to that truth until the Holy Spirit revealed Jesus to us. 
Jesus came to be our Savior. What a wonderful change that made. We come now to observe the communion, the Lord's Supper. And as we hold in our hand the broken bread and the symbol of the shed blood, we acknowledge Jesus. We acknowledge Calvary. We acknowledge the cross. And we rejoice that you have made yourself real to us in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.